hope everyone's having a pleasant afternoon. Uh, we are driving up today from sunny South Carolina where it was 81 degrees uh, this uh, around noontime uh, to the DC area today. And then tomorrow morning we'll be heading up to a place called Hanover, New Jersey. Uh, we drove down yesterday from Pennsylvania, from Eastern Pennsylvania, the Bethlehem area. It took about 12 hours. Well, we we left at 5.30 in the morning, got in at 5.30 p.m. And I guess of those 12 hours, we were probably driving only about 11. And it's neat, if you use the trip odometer, it actually has a, uh, on the right there, it's got like a drive time meter. If you keep track of that time and thing, that type of thing. And it measures either the amount of time the engine's on or maybe the amount of time you've got it in drive and you're actually moving. Hard to say. But we we drove about, like I said, about 11 hours yesterday during a 12-hour period. No big deal. Uh, maybe 650 miles. Very, very smooth drive. And if you know about it, uh, Interstate 81 uh, goes through a series of valleys and it really starts all the way down in Birmingham, Alabama, which is where it's, I think, I-59 or 57, or whatever it is, leads up to Chattanooga area, up to Knoxville, and then through, like, southwestern Virginia, like Roanoke area, Lexington, all the way up through Winchester, and then up through, like, it briefly cuts into West Virginia, briefly cuts into Maryland at like the Hagerstown area. And then it continues up into Pennsylvania. Um, you know, Chambersburg, Carlisle. And the one city of any substantial size that it goes through is Harrisburg. Um, so from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, all the way down to like Knoxville, Tennessee, it's basically a straight shot, very, very gradual, because um, you're going through a series of valleys. It's like the Lehigh Valley, Bethlehem area, uh, and at that point it's I-78, and it goes all the way actually to New York City on 78. But then when we left out yesterday morning, like I said, the, the Bethlehem area, on 78 going west through the Lehigh Valley and then picking up 81 at Harrisburg, and then going southwest through like Maryland, West Virginia, and then through like the spine of the, essentially the Shenandoah Valley, all the way down towards Roanoke. It's an exceptionally smooth drive and you don't have any big city rush hour traffic to, traffic to deal with once you get past Harrisburg. And you also don't have a ton of traffic in general to deal with. Um, because it's just 18 wheelers and maybe snowbirds in their RVs and their campers. And those people for the most part know how to drive. And so it's, it's pretty easy to make your way down that interstate. And you're not doing a ton of steep, steep uphill climbing or steep downhill descents like you get on Interstate 80 going through Pennsylvania or like 76 going through Pennsylvania or like, you know, I-70 going through Colorado or I-15 going up through, like, Death Valley in the Mojave Desert towards uh, Las Vegas. It's just a very, very smooth ride. Um, and it's great for this truck and trailer. Or really for anybody who's towing a heavy vehicle that's coming close to maxing out their, their truck's capabilities. And to be honest, this truck here, the 2021 F-150 with the 3.0 Power Stroke Diesel uh, crew cab, four-wheel drive, six-and-a-half-foot bed, uh, XLT package with the 302A, your 12-inch sink. You know, it's a good truck in a lot of ways, but you can kind of tell why they discontinued the diesel as much as we love it. Because you do run into its limits relatively quickly once you start hitching up a heavy enough trailer to it. Um, we got our 28-foot Featherlight model 4941. It's, it's all aluminum. It's an enclosed gooseneck cargo trailer, or what they would call a car hauler. And it's about the perfect trailer for this truck. It's about the biggest trailer you'd want to put on this truck. Um, and, uh, and you kind of need to be careful how much you load into it. Because although the truck has a claimed, a so-called 
uh, 16,000 pound Max uh, uh, GCWR, gross combined weight rating, which is the weight of the truck and trailer put together, meaning about a 6,000 pound truck plus a 10,000 pound trailer. There's no way in hell you'd wanna put a 10,000 pound trailer on this thing. Uh, because the engine, it, it, it's, it's not that it's gutless, but it does only have 250 horsepower. It's a little, it's a little three liter diesel. It's a very, very small engine. Um, and it does have, I think, 400 plus pound feet of torque, but it's, especially if you're doing a lot of uphill, uh, uh, you know, hill climbs with it on a road like Interstate 80 going through the mountains in Pennsylvania. You're not going through a valley, you're going up and down the mountains themselves. And this engine does reach its limits. Um, but yesterday on Interstate 81, that was about the perfect highway for this truck uh, and this trailer. Because it's just gradually, it's all valleys. Very, very gradual uphills and downhills. Um, you know, we had that issue we've talked about a number of times before where the transmission, this is the 10R80, uh, the light duty 10 speed automatic that Ford puts in the F-150. It just like, it gets confused going uphill when you have a trailer and you put it in tow haul mode, which is supposed to adjust the, uh, you know, the strategy, the gear shifting strategy, and it just doesn't know what to do. It, it will try to upshift as fast as possible and get into 10th gear and stay in 10th gear. Even when you're going up a steep hill with a heavy trailer, at like 60 miles an hour in, you know, at like at like 1,200 RPMs in 10th gear, and it just doesn't know, hey, maybe we shouldn't do that. Uh, maybe we shouldn't go up a very steep hill in the highest possible gear at the lowest possible RPMs. Um, and so you got to spend a lot of time uh, locking out the upper gears. Generally speaking, uh, we are always locking out 10th gear when we've got the, a trailer on this thing. And so for the most part, the, the, the top gear that it's going to get into is ninth gear, which is what it's in right now. And we're on a gradual, gradual descent right now. And so you can have it in ninth gear, either going slightly downhill or even on the flat. Um, but then when you, once you start to go uphill, no, you got you to gotta get on that uh, the plus minus button on the shifter and lock out even ninth gear so that you're going up a, you know, a gradual incline in eighth gear because the name of the game is to keep this truck when it's under load uh, somewhere between 1,700 and 2,200 RPMs. That's the sweet spot. That's where it wants to be. Um, and if and, and again, going uphill, that usually means eighth gear, going up a gradual hill. And then going downhill, that usually means ninth gear. You know, you're not running a ton of boost when you're going downhill. You still got some, but not a huge amount. And so, uh, so it kind of makes you do that. And so you have to spend uh, a good portion of your time watching the RPMs and watching the gear and making sure it's in the right gear for the RPMs and, uh, and all that. And that's, that's not a huge mental workload, but it's, but it's more than you really ought to have to do in a, in a, in an intelligent vehicle with an intelligent transmission in tow haul mode. And you know, you load in the length of the trailer, you load in the weight of the trailer. And so it kind of ought to know what to do, but it just doesn't. Um, and then downhill, we talked about it, it doesn't have any engine braking. And so you're riding the brakes downhill. Um, and that's enormously annoying, but we've talked about it. I'm not gonna belabor it. Um, both of those fixes would be easy for Ford to make with just a software update to the, like the TCM, the PCM. Um, if they really care to. But they've sunsetted the engine and so as far as they're concerned, you can just kind of deal with it. And so we're just kind of dealing with it. Um, super interesting to see how, uh, how much uh, the Carolinas are changing. Um, we've been coming down I-85, which is what we're on right now. We've been coming down Interstate 85 from like the DC area, uh, 
used to go all the way down to Columbus, Georgia when we were stationed at Fort Benning. That was like 25, 30 years ago in the 90s, in the mid 90s. Um, and there was not a lot on Interstate 85 back then. It was, it was pretty empty. Um, you did have that BMW factory that went in in Spartanburg, South Carolina. But that was basically it. You know, you had Greensboro, you had Charlotte, um, but not a lot else. And now there's like massive amounts of housing going in uh, for all the people that are fleeing, trying to escape from like New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, that part of the uh, country. And you got all these warehouses going in for distribution. Um, I mean, it's crazy how much development has happened. Uh, in the last, probably just in the last five or ten years, if not twenty. Um, but everybody wants to live in North and South Carolina, or maybe even further south in like Florida, Georgia, but definitely at least as far south. Um, and so you just see tons and tons and tons of new housing going in. It's amazing how much of the change there's been. And what's also neat is that like this time of year, late March, early April, April, you got the leaves starting to come in. You know, when you get this far south. Um, and then, you know, when you come south, it's getting prettier and prettier. Because there isn't a lot happening yet in the in the northeast and, like, the upper Midwest. It's still pretty dead and gloomy. Uh, but down here, it's starting to get real pretty this time of year. And then as you go back north, you see, few, you see less and less of that. And, and there's, like, fewer and fewer buds and you know, whatever, the trees aren't blossoming and it's, it gets kind of gloomy and depressing again real fast as you go back north. Um, there's a ton of wind today, huge amount of wind today. Uh, and fortunately for us, we got this gooseneck trailer and a gooseneck trailer uh, is going to be largely, not completely, but largely uh, unaffected by strong side winds because of the fact that it's anchored to the rear axle of the truck. And so it's firmly anchored in the front and back. And there's much less of an opportunity for it to start acting up on you and swaying and, and, and trying to get you sideways and, and put you off the road and uh, send you down a ravine to an early grave. Uh, you don't really notice the wind hardly at all. I mean, there's a small, small amount of play in the steering wheel, very small amount, um, but nothing really that's worth worrying about. Uh, the self-driving system, which is your lane centering and your adaptive cruise control, work perfectly with this trailer. And again, we drove it for 650 miles yesterday. Had zero issues. Uh, for the most part, the truck drove itself, even with a 28-foot trailer hitched up to it. And oh, by the way, the gas mileage, again, over the course of 650 miles, um, in an F-150 with a 28-foot trailer was 17.0 miles to the gallon. And that's, that's pretty damn good um, with this size of a trailer hitched up to an F-150. Part of that is because you got a diesel engine. We, we're running a diesel engine, which is just inherently efficient, much more so than a gas engine under heavy load, especially a turbocharged engine like the EcoBoost. Um, and partly because the, the gooseneck trailer, uh, especially an enclosed one, it's almost like it's... It, it's uh, the aerodynamics are uh, it, 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 like that tapered, you know, we got the tapered nose on this, not a flat nose um, and not a V nose, but the tapered nose where it sort of comes up and over the bed of the truck, it it sort of integrates itself into the aerodynamics of the truck, um, similar to how an 18-wheeler trailer does it with the, uh, with the tractor, and it sort of streamlines itself in with the, uh, with the truck. And so you don't have the effect that you do in a regular pickup with a regular trailer where you've got a house-shaped object towing a barn-shaped object with a big gap in between. Um, and so look at today's gas mileage. 19.4, that's exceptionally good. And it could be part of the, part of the difference between yesterday and today could be that we've got like warm weather diesel, you know, not like summer blend, but like, I don't know, 
uh, it's definitely different than the, the diesel you get up in the Northeast in like Pennsylvania. Um, and you tend to get better gas mileage with, uh, with summer blend fuel. It's got less of the anti-gel. It's got less of uh, a lot of the stuff that you need to put in diesel in the winter uh, to keep it from, uh, you know, gelling up and, and clogging up your, uh, your fuel lines with, um, with like wax completely uh, fouling up your fuel system. So I don't know what it is. Um, 85 is, is a, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty smooth highway. It's not nearly as smooth as 81. You know, you get you get a, a quite a bit more uphill and downhill. Uh, you know, you know, gentle rises, gentle, uh, uh, you know, downhill portions. It's not steep, but there's there's much more than you get on 81. And our speeds are quite a bit higher than they were yesterday. You know, we're in the we're in the upper 60s. You know, maybe 70 every now and then, but. Uh, it's it's which is about what we were doing yesterday and yet over the course of the first 200 miles today we're getting like 19 and a half mpgs we got about 250 to go headed up to dc and so that's astounding 19 and a half mpgs towing a 28 foot trailer behind an f-150 uh, our total weight is we just weighed in it's 11,500 so that's a 6,000 pound truck and a 5,500 pound trailer. And we talked about it before, you gotta be very, very careful uh, how you load the trailer so that you don't accidentally uh, max out the, the, the rear axle, the drive axle on the truck. And so you gotta have the weight uh, balanced uh, in the trailer so that it's not too far back to where it unloads the, uh, the hitch weight completely but not so far forward that you give yourself too much hitch weight and then you crush the rear axle and you start to affect the stability of the uh, of the truck to where that, that overloaded rear axle starts getting squirmy and starts getting pushed around and, and, uh, and puts you into an unsafe condition and also puts you over your maximum axle weight and your maximum total weight for that truck, which gets you into a legal and not just a safety problem. Uh, but again, today with uh, with a total of eleven thousand five hundred, the truck's doing just fine. The truck's doing just fine. Uh, subject to that issue that we got, where you basically have to tell the transmission uh, what to do and how high it can shift, since it doesn't really know that on its own. There's a little bit of bucking, a very very slight amount of bucking, where like the trailer is kind of pulling back and forth on the truck. Um, it's like a, it's like a, some kind of harmonic or something that it gets into. No big deal. Um, we picked up about, uh, call it about a 1500 pound load yesterday at North American Rescue, which is in Greer, South Carolina. About 5,000 combat tourniquets, just under two pallets. No big deal. Um, we wouldn't want to go out whole lot heavier uh, with this truck and trailer. It's, it's a, uh, you know, again, we're at 11.5. The max gross combined weight rating for the truck and trailer put together is 16,000 pounds with this truck, 18,000 pounds with the max tow package, which is what our power boost has. But, you know, it's not a stability issue because this thing's perfectly stable, even in, like I said, really, really stiff sidewinds, strong sidewinds. It's not a stability issue. It's just like the engine just, it, it, it's not super happy. Um, and, uh, and again, going down any substantial downhill, uh, you know, see what's happening here. We're down to like 15, 1600 RPMs in ninth gear. And so we got to force it to downshift into eighth by locking out ninth gear and get it up to like 2,100 RPMs. And it doesn't know that on its own, even though it should. So we're doing a lot of that, you know, a lot of the plus and minus with the right hand, um, and a lot of adjusting the cruise control with the left hand. And we keep the cruise control on and the self-driving system on 
90 plus percent of the time we're on the highway. 95 plus percent of the time, because it just, that portion of it, that portion of the truck, this software package, the, uh, again, what we call the self-driving system, lane centering and adaptive cruise control, knows exactly what to do. You don't even need Blue Cruise. Blue Cruise, in, in our estimation, is a, a waste of your money. And we would never, ever in a million years trust a truck, uh, especially with a trailer, to drive itself hands-free. That seems like that seems like a, an invitation to disaster. And again, you see the same thing. We're going uphill in ninth gear. It's at like 1,500. And it's just not super happy. So you got to get on that minus button and force it to downshift into the eighth. Get to the top of the hill. Hit the plus button, which allows it to upshift into ninth gear and gives it those full nine, uh, nine forward speeds. But there's really no point in time where we let it upshift in a tenth as much as it wants to. Uh, a couple other things about this truck. It, uh, uh, again, the trailer is performing exactly as advertised. We're at, uh, you know, we're at 39,780. The truck's about to hit 40,000 miles. The truck is working just fine. Again, you can see why they discontinue the diesel. It's 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 not the happiest right now. I mean, it'll it'll do what we tell it, but it's not it's not thrilled um, to be pulling this much of a trailer. I think it would be I think it would be exceptionally unhappy pulling another couple thousand pounds to where we hit like 12,000, 13,000 total weight which is a 6,000 pound truck pulling a six or 7,000 pound trailer. I, I, I would not want to put more than a, let's call it a 7,500 pound trailer on this truck. Because look again, it's starting to lug. It's like, it's like down at 1,500 and it's, and it's just, you know, with the boost gauge completely pegged. And it's like, it doesn't know what to do. Um, Anyway, a couple other things about the truck. Uh, I, you know, we, we've done basically zero maintenance on it other than oil and filter changes every six or 7,000 miles. Uh, change out the fuel filter every second, every other oil change. Uh, and also uh, drain the fuel water separator. Ford. Uh, Ford specs the 5W30 uh, synthetic blend, not even full synthetic for this engine. A very small, hard-working turbo diesel engine, which is, in our estimation, that's ridiculous to be putting synthetic blend into a hard-working, small turbo diesel engine. That's, like, preposterous. And, and we've, you know, there's been a lot of discussions about it in the different forums and the Facebook groups. And so we've started telling the dealer uh, specifically to put the 5W40 full synthetic in it, which is the same oil they put in the 6.7 Power Stroke. And it's not like they complain, but it's, it's uh, you know, they'll do whatever you tell them to do. But it's just weird that the factory would say, no, it's perfectly fine to put a synthetic blend in this thing and and people have done you know oil analysis sent out their oil to be uh to be tested and know that synthetic blend is not what you want not at all what you want uh for this engine or any turbocharged engine like the 35 eco boost um the tires were running we still got the uh, the factory michelins that it came with i think they're like atx's or ltx's I'm not sure exactly what they're called but it's like an all-terrain tire. Uh, and on this truck, it's a 17-inch rim. On the Power Boost, it's got a 20-inch rim, which you have to get with the Max Toe package. Um, maybe to make room for the brakes, the bigger brakes, not sure. Um, but we much prefer the 17s. They work very, very well. Uh, and these tires are starting to get worn down. They're not close to being bald yet, but they're, uh, they're also not really ideal for like going through heavy, heavy rain. And we hit some rain yesterday. We had to actually navigate around 
uh, a, 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 a like a massive like thunderstorm cell uh, just like southwest of Roanoke had to jump off of 81 early and go down through like Greensboro and Charlotte um, but the Michelins are starting to get worn down, the factory Michelins, and we're going to replace them with the same ones that we put on the Power Stroke when the Power Stroke hit 50,000 miles. And we'll probably have to do that a little bit sooner on this one, like at around like 42, 43. Um, and those are called uh, Michelin XLTs, and apparently you can only get them at Costco, and it's an all-season as opposed to an all-terrain. And so you're not going to be doing any rock crawling with it or like mud bogging. Um, but it is it is a it is a really really solid tire, and it's got super super wide channels between the lugs, like looking at it longitudinally, uh, to to evacuate tons and tons of water or slush or whatever else you're getting into. Um, not really ideal for mud because the it doesn't have a lot of bite. It's not going to bite into to to loose like sand or mud, um, but it also won't get packed with with that kind of thing. So it's just a good tire, and we'll be putting that in shortly. Um, two issues with this, uh, with the fuel filler on this truck, believe it or not. Um, the def filler is just fine. The def filler is right next to the fuel. Uh, you know, you open the same door, the same flap there. And you got to wonder how many people have accidentally put def in the gas tank, in the fuel tank. Um, since, the, since the two, you know, filler ports are right next to each other. Um, we have known, we know a gentleman who accidentally put gasoline in a diesel truck. Um, you know, it turns out common sense. Not everybody, not everybody learns these things, you know? Uh, anyway, the, uh, the diesel fuel filler on this thing is small and it's only compatible with like the pump it's, it's not compatible with like the trucker nozzles at like a truck stop. And so when you've got a big trailer hitched up and this thing is, uh, you know, this thing, like there's like of the 28 feet total on it, probably 22 or 23 hang behind the, the, the back bumper and maybe five or so, five or six go up over the, uh, the bed. And so that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a moderately long size trailer, but because Ford did not put the, uh, uh, did not make the, the nozzle big enough or the hole big enough in the fuel filler. You can't go at a truck stop to like the trucker pumps and top up there. So you got to go to the island where there's like, you know, your Hondas and your Kias and your SUVs and your soccer moms and everybody's sort of jammed in there. And you got to show up with your F-150 and your, uh, and your big trailer and just get in everybody's way and kind of piss everyone off and and run the risk of running into somebody or having somebody run into you. And that's kind of frustrating. The other thing is that uh, the, the, the the fuel port has like a safety catch on it to keep you from accidentally putting in uh, gasoline, which is a guaranteed way to destroy your fuel system in no time at all, especially because this truck has a CP4 uh, high pressure pump, the Bosch CP4 high pressure uh, injection pump which would be destroyed in no time at all by gasoline or even low quality fuel, which is a whole nother story. Um, and so you gotta like mess around and, uh, and and when you're trying to put your additive in, your fuel additive, which you gotta do or which you ought to do every time you top off, um, it's hard to actually get it to go into the fuel filler because the fuel filler is like locked shut by the safety catch. And so you gotta, uh, it's a pretty view. And so we kind of fiddled around and messed around and it makes a huge mess because uh, you think you're getting it in there and actually you're not and it's just kind of spilling all over the place. And so the trick we learned is that like you got to put the, the diesel fuel nozzle like halfway into the, uh, halfway down into the, into the fill port and then sort of back it out a little and then pour your, uh, like your hot shots, your EDT onto the fuel nozzle and have it just sort of drain or drip into the uh, into the fuel tank and that's the only thing we figured out if you can if you can think of another way or if you all know another way to do that please indicate as much in the comments uh, but in any case overall uh, after probably 
850, almost 900 miles of pulling this 28 foot trailer, 28 foot Featherlight model 4941 with the F-150. We are very, very happy with it. Exceptionally happy with it. And uh, looking forward to uh, bigger and better things to come. Uh, we're tempted to put a gooseneck hitch on our power boost because of the fact that it has, uh, as opposed to this thing, as compared to this thing, it's got mountains and mountains of power and torque in any gear, at any RPM, in any uh, road speed. And it does, you know, some degree of engine braking. Not as much as we'd like, but a lot more than this thing. So it solves those problems. But it also has much softer springs. Um, it doesn't have the FX4 package which uh, for once in its life is actually doing a good job by controlling the, uh, the motion of that rear axle with all that uh, hitch weight on it. And so we're thinking about it. Um, and we'll see, we'll, you know, may or may not, depending. But for now, we're pulling this trailer with our diesel F-150 and, uh, and it's working out pretty well. It's working out actually really well. Um, very happy with the trailer. Very, very happy with the trailer. And we'll see if this ends up being the perfect truck to tow it with. For now, it's doing a good job, though. All right, everyone. Well, I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend, and we will talk to you later.